Heavenly Father, as we take up this morning's study, we ask that you'd grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit. Um, please take control of my thoughts, my words, that what is presented would be edifying for uh, the brothers and sisters that are listening, and that it would glorify and honor you. We want the latter rain poured out upon us, and uh, we ask that you do that now. Please bless us with light at this time, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, um, by way of explanation, I'm gonna, I know some of you in this room may have to leave after this first presentation, um, and that's fine, but I need to do two presentations this morning. So those of you that are watching live stream, if you can't stay for the second one, maybe you can watch it later or know that we're going to do one, take a break, and then come back and do another one. Okay, that being said, this morning I prepared, um, this is, I prepared these notes. Okay, these, I, there's two sets of notes that would be online right now. The one we're going to begin with is called the French Revolution. And the other one um, for the second presentation is here. But the other one, as I was working on it on Microsoft, Microsoft Word, much of the other one is in this as well because we had a snafu sending over the notes. Okay, so about half of these notes are the second presentation, so know that going in. But more importantly, in my mind, I spent a, quite a while this morning preparing page one for these notes that we're going to begin with. And when I sent them over here through email, page one didn't come. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what page one is. And I haven't the time to go back home and, and, and bring it. And I'll present page one tomorrow. And it would have been... It's, logically, it seems like I sh it's where I wanted to start. And what it was is it was just two parallel columns, okay, with several references to remind us of the period of the midnight cry to the Sunday law, okay? And, and I wanted us to remember the beginning way marks, the characteristics of the midnight cry, and then the characteristics of the Sunday law. And I went down and made several beginning and endings of those parallels for the purpose of reminding us that once you see that history from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, that that history gets repeated from the Sunday law to the close of probation. Okay, so as, as an example of yesterday's presentation, um, I didn't take time to address that that characteristic of prophecy. And all I did yesterday was I dealt with three lines of the French Revolution that I'm saying are all the French Revolution. A 10-year period from 1789 to 1799. That's the French Revolution as defined by the historians. But I said the reign of terror as defined by Sister White is 1793 to 1796. But I'm saying that the reign of terror defined also by Sister White, if you can read it into it, but more probably I'll take credit, I'm the one that's saying the Reign of Terror was the one year from July 27, 1793 to July 27, 1794. So I was saying that all three of these histories are the same history, probably governed by the idea of fractals, that from here to here you have the 10 years of the French Revolution from 1789 to 1799. But you also have the, the Vendee War from 1793 to 1796. But you also have what I'm calling the Reign of Terror from July 27, 1793 to July 27, 1794. But as I was dealing with that yesterday, all I did, and this is the part I want you to see, is I, I was putting in 1789 here at the Midnight Cry, and 1798-99 over here at the Sunday Law, if you remember. And I wasn't dealing with the, the fact that in the Midnight Cry, you also are going to take this history and bring it over here from the Sunday Law to the close of probation. It gets doubled. Okay, so this morning, I want to emphasize, go back and remind us, we've dealt with this a great deal in this series, 
that the most important reason that the second angel's message and the midnight cry is symbolically represented in prophecy with a doubling is to teach God's people at the end of the world that the history of the image of the beast testing time in the United States is repeated in the history of the image of the beast testing time in the world. Uh, that the history of the midnight cry from the midnight cry to the Sunday law is the history of the loud cry from the Sunday law to the close of probation. So that is the page that didn't get sent over here this morning that we'll begin with to tomorrow morning. So now to the notes that uh, are titled The French Revolution. And when I get home uh, today, I'm going to take the notes that you have if you've downloaded them offline. And I'm going to send the right ones over to Larry. Actually, the notes that I would have wanted to use a day would have had this parallel column that I just mentioned on it and I would have had the title the French Revolution part 2 because the presentation yesterday was the French Revolution part 1 and I also am going to take out the, the last half of these notes which make up the third so if you want to keep your notes straight download them again tomorrow and discard these notes so, this note is where we're starting here, the French Revolution. I, I have shrunk down some of the, the way marks we've already put in place. There's a three-fold union that takes place at the Midnight Cry and at the Sunday Law. Okay, at the Midnight Cry, um, you're going to have the government of the United States, the Protestant churches, and the Seventh-day Adventist church. The government of the United States is typifying the dragon. The Protestants are the beast. They form the image of the beast or to the beast. And the false prophet is the Seventh-day Adventist church that at the midnight cry is going to agree with the, the coming Sunday law. That's typifying the threefold union that takes place at the Sunday Law of Daniel 11 verse 41 or Revelation 13 11, which is the threefold union of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The first quote that I've just, we've dealt with the quote in fully over the past couple of presentations, a little snippet I have here from Testimonies Volume 5, says that at the Sunday Law, then we know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan. Okay, this is when he personates Christ at the Sunday Law of Daniel 11, verse 41. But at the midnight cry, there has to be some kind of activity that, that typifies Satan personating Christ. Okay, so there's going to be, an, that also will take place after the midnight cry, um, some type of satanic manifestation as God's judgment is, is being executed um, upon Adventism, upon the United States, and upon the world. Okay, um, and then the next quote from Great Controversy, at, which is a threefold union quote, um, what I'm pulling out of there is that at the threefold union, this country will follow on the step, in the steps of Roman trampling on the rights of consciousness, conscience. So at the Sunday Law, persecution is marked as beginning. The Sunday Law, verse 41, therefore at the midnight cry there will be a persecution that begins that's typifying the Sunday Law that takes place, the, the persecution that takes place at the Sunday Law. And then the third quote that we used yesterday in terms of the threefold union is where Sister White was very specific that it's Satan that joins with Protestants and Papists at the Threefold Union. Satan, we can call him the dragon, but we took time to say that this is Satan personating Christ. He's on the scene, and this is very important to see in the context of the kingdom of the beast. Remember, in Daniel's last vision, there are four kingdoms. There's the kingdom of the 144,000. There's the kingdom of the dragon. That's actually what we're still dealing with. We're dealing with the, king of the, the story of the king of the south right now. But there's the kingdom of the beast, the papacy. And that storyline is Fatima. And Fatima is preparing, has prepared the Catholic Church to accept Satan as their leader. When he appears in person, after the Sunday Law in the United States, he has prepared the Catholic Church to turn their worldwide organization over to him. He wanted a worldwide organization to rule the world with. 
So he built the Catholic Church for that purpose, and he conditioned the Catholics to accept him as Christ through the prophecies of Fatima. So when we see the threefold union at the Sunday Law, this particular quote is very clear by Sister White that it is Satan that joins with Protestants and Papists, okay? In this regard, Satan is the dragon, Protestants are the false prophet, and the Papists are the beast. Um, okay, and then Ichabod uh, from 1 Samuel 4, 21 and 22. Um, this is where um, Shiloh is overthrown, the Ark of God is captured, and Eli and Hophni and Phinehas are all executed by the Lord, if you want to say it that way. That's how I want to say it. And is it Phineas' wife? I think it's Phineas' wife has a baby that she names Ichabod, which means the glory is gone, the glory is removed. And at the Sunday Law, which the story of Shiloh typifies, when the Ark of God, the Law of God, is captured at the Sunday Law in Daniel 11, verse 41, the glory, the Constitution of the United States is its glory. The glory is fully removed. Ichabod. Okay, so you plug that in there. But you also plug in Ichabod at the midnight cry because there will be... That's just another attack on the Constitution. It's fully thrown out at the Sunday Law. But the Constitution is a storyline of the United States, of Donald Trump and the United States. So it it is a, a storyline that works all the way through here, and Ichabod speaks to the term glory in terms of the glorious land coming to its conclusion at the Sunday Law as the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. Okay, it, at, at that point a dictatorship is set up, and uh, we're looking at dictatorship, saying that at uh, the midnight cry here, July 18th, the dictatorship is going to arrive there, but we're seeing in advance of that, even right now, the harbingers of a dictatorship that are going on here in this country and even in the world, okay? And you would expect that. There's going to be active despotism in this country, Sister White says, and we're placing this dictatorship from the midnight cry to the Sunday law. But that history from the Midnight Cry to the Sunday Law is the history of the Sunday Law to the close of probation. So there's going to be dictatorship from the Sunday Law to the close of probation also. So if there's going to be a dictatorship that encompasses the whole world in that history, and it's being typified by the dictatorship in the United States, then you should also be seeing the world getting prepared for a dictatorship as well. And you can see these harbingers in the world. Some of the countries in the world are being much more aggressive on how they deal with this pandemic than Trump is. So you, it, what I'm saying is the activity of taking control of travel, of, of what's going on right now, is pointing to the active despotism that returns um, that arrives at the Sunday Law. Okay, the other thing we've mentioned is that the people in the United States are going to push for a Sunday Law in, in order to return to temporal prosperity. Um, our, our unemployment in this country is not at 42 percent right now, but the, some of the financial experts in the United States are saying it has the potential to go there with this current crisis. And in the Great Depression of the 1930s, the unemployment rate was 27%. Um, and they're saying we have the potential to go to 42%. And they are desperately sending out trillions of dollars to get this economy running. But you and I know that Sister White says they're struggling in vain to put business operations on a more secure basis. So here, as we approach this period of the midnight cry to the Sunday Law, we see the harbingers of the temporal prosperity being removed from the United States um, in agreement with Bible prophecy, um, which is preparing the people of the land to cry out to the legislators pass a Sunday law to return us to temporal prosperity because it's these 
um, troublers of the people, these Elijahs, uh, these, um, what's Esther's uncle, Mordecai's at the gate that are causing all this problem. Um, and they need to be dealt with so we can return to temporal prosperity. There's going to be a civil war, uh, according to inspiration. Um, the first Republican president was president during the Civil War. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. The last Republican president is Donald Trump. There will be a civil war. And we pointed out yesterday that um, in spite of the economic problems that are hitting this country right now, the one economic problem, one industry that's not having an economic problem is ammunition and gun sales are through the roof. And uh, Clayton was telling me he's, he's been following a little bit of this yesterday and what is being noted now that isn't typically noted in these times of Americans buying guns and ammo is that the liberals, the Democrats are buying them as well. Usually it's the conservatives that run out and, and load up on their ammunition at the, the most gun and ammunition sales of American history was in the two terms of Obama, okay? But there's nothing like what's going on right now, but it's both liberals and conservatives, and what I'm saying is those bullets are a harbinger of a civil war that's, that will take place in fulfillment of God's word. And slavery is to be revived, Sister White says, and... I'm emphasizing this particularly for the French Revolution because one of the waymarks in the French Revolution is where slavery was done away with. Therefore, at that waymark, which is the midnight cry, um, slavery will be revived. And the French Revolution gives us a backup witness to this. Okay, I'm on page two now. Um, that was a review of some of the prophetic characteristics that we've been dealing with. Uh, we've already put this quote in place more than once on the top of page two about the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Re Revolution all are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. The teachings uh, that led to the French Revolution are the teachings that are disseminated through the liberal news media and the liberal politicians. Um, if you were going to, based upon inspiration, lay your fingers on the problem here, it's the liberal philosophy that is bringing about this revolution, more than the conservative, all right? But I'm not, I'm not choosing Sadducees over Pharisees. Both of them come together to crucify Christ, simply saying that it's these Jesuit liberation theology uh, philosophies that are leading to revolution. And this isn't a new idea from when we first began teaching Daniel 1140, we identified that one of the characteristics of the King of the South was revolution. We said that the revolution in France when the King of the South came into prophetic history was repeated in the revolution in Russia when Russia became the King of the South. And I've looked, some, some persons put it in the public record not so very long ago, where they took the characteristics of the French Revolution and they showed how the Russian Revolution had these same characteristics. I wish I could put my fingers on that because I, I don't remember all of it. Um, but in the French Revolution, the, the, there's a key point in the French Revolution where the women um, make a march upon the king concerning the bread. They were complaining about bread, and that's a, a waymark in French history that leads to the French Revolution. Um, there's a, a, a taking over by the, the revolutionaries of the, the Bastille, where the, the guns and weapons were kept, and they took control of that. And you go to the Russian Revolution, and there was a the point in the Russian Revolution where there was a place where they maintained ammunition and guns, and it, the it was attempted to be taken over, and but it didn't succeed. And why didn't it succeed? Is because there was a Russian unit there that prevented it from happening, and it was an all-woman Russian force. So you you have women as players in both the Russian Revolution at the end of this history and the French Revolution. 
Um, you have the king, the leader of France, losing his head. You have the, um, what's the name of the, the, the czar's family, the, um, that got executed, all of them. Anyway, you, you have the, the leader of Russia um, getting executed, that whole family, the, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway. I, I can't tell with that. The, par the, the parallel between the... F pardon me? The Romanovs. The Romanovs. There you go. Thank you. The Romanovs families all executed, um, as was the king. So there's parallels there um, that identify revolution at the beginning of the King of the South in France, when the modern King of the South, Russia, takes place, and then we would always identify that the, the mode of Russia sp spreading its philosophy around the world was revolution in the time of Ronald Reagan, which is one of the presidents that typifies Donald Trump for lots of reasons. Um, he was dealing with uh, revolution in Central and South America that was accomplished through the same teachings um, that they always use and in South America and Central America it was called liberation theology it's the theology of the Jesuits of the Catholic Church it's the theology of this current vile Pope um, and it's the theology it's the philosophy that brought about the French Revolution and we've taught that all the way along one of the characteristics of the King of the South is revolution. Okay, so um, the dissemination that causes the revolution, the teachings that cause the revolution are the, the liberal teachings. Okay, in August 4, 1789, in France, they abolish feudalism. Um, feudalism being a system of slavery, what I'm saying, and in doing so, it's taking slavery away from both church and state, from the royalty and the Catholic Church. So there's there's lots of lots of things in there, and we're, we know that slavery returns. I'm going to place that at the midnight cry, and also at the Sunday law when the history is repeated. And it's going to be if it's going to if slavery is going to return, and this. Removal of feudalism in the French Revolution is a valid application in 1789. If 1789 lines up with the midnight cry, it does. It also lines up with the Sunday Law and the second repeat, but let's just stick with 1789. If this history lines up with 1789, then many times, what does prophecy do? It reverses itself. Okay, The classic example of this is that Elijah dealt with a threefold enemy, Jezebel, Ahab, and the prophets of Baal. They wanted to kill Elijah, but they couldn't kill Elijah. And Jesus said John the Baptist was Elijah. And John the Baptist dealt with a threefold enemy. Herod, Herodias, and Salome did the dance of deception. They wanted to kill Elijah. They wanted to kill John the Baptist, and they did so. It was reversed. So what I'm saying is the fact that Slavery was done away with in France in 1789, and that lines up with the midnight cry when slavery is returned. Who's going to be allowed to exercise slavery at the midnight cry? It's going to be the royalty and the Catholic Church was what it was taken away from in 1789, so it's going to be church and state, and the midnight cry is the marker of the image of the beast testing time. It's this system that has been typified at this level by the Catholic Church and the royalty of France, church and state, midnight cry, image of the beast testing time. It fits there perfectly. Okay, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, that's the Constitution in France in 1789, the same year the Constitution of the United States is put in place. What we're dealing with here, even though I've probably left it so vague that you're, you're not remembering, we're dealing with the storyline of the King of the South, how Russia comes to a conclusion in 2021. But we're showing connections along the way. Russia's in a struggle with the United States, and the storyline of the United States is the Constitution. 
that was put in place in 1789, the same year that the French Constitution is put in place, and this is easy to see if you go, if you Google it, this is a, a large historical fact where it says Declaration of the Rights of Man on page two of your notes. The Declaration was directly influenced by Thomas Jefferson working with General Lafayette, okay, and what's, what's his, uh, if I wasn't going to call him General, what's his first name? The, what would you correct me on Lafayette's Marquis de, de, Lafayette, de Lafayette? Okay, this is the Marquis de Lafayette. Okay, he he becomes a hero of the Revolutionary War. This Frenchman. Okay, he becomes friends with Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, the main author of our Constitution, works with Lafayette, who becomes the main contributor to the French Constitution. You you have to see this connection. And, and Lafayette becomes a hero in the United States, so much so that years later he comes to the United States and every city they come to, it's like uh, people come out in hordes to greet him and thank him for his participation in the Revolutionary War. Even William Miller speaks about meeting Lafayette and taking him out to dinner. Okay, he was, he was a hero even to William Miller. And when did William Miller get get turned around on his deistic ideas. I don't remember the year, but it was in the Revolutionary War. Yeah. But I do remember the day. Yeah, 9-11. It was September 11th, whatever year it was, that at a specific battle in, up on the Canadian border where William Miller seen God's hand in this, in this battle and he left his deistic thoughts. And it was on September 11th. When did Lafayette become a hero. Well, he became a hero because he participated in a battle in the United States and he got wounded. It was also a battle of the Revolutionary War and he got wounded and became a hero on September 11th that year. Okay. Uh, so you, you, you got to see the connections of these people uh, prophetically. And so what I'm saying is when we're marking 1789 as the rights of man in the French Revolution, you can't separate it from the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the United States is the storyline of the kingdom of the false prophet in Daniel 11, okay? We're dealing now here with wills within wills, and you, you need to begin to get these things in your, your mind if you can. Now, um, under the reign of terror, I'm, I'm saying that uh, the 10 years of the French Revolution gets plugged in up there from the first way mark to the second way mark. But I'm saying that the first year of, or the year of 1793 to 1794, July 27th to July 27th of that year, is also part of that history a fractal part of that history. I hope, I hope it's okay to call it a fractal, but it plugs into the same way marks. Okay? It doesn't begin in 1789. It begins in 1793. It's the beginning of the reign of terror. It begins um, when a dictator is put in place. Who's the dictator that's put in place? His name is Robespierre. 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 And what puts him in place? Who, who gets removed in order for him to become a, a dictator? Louis XVI. The king of France loses his head. Okay, so in 1793 you have a dictator coming into play, and at the and at the end of that year, a year later, what happens to Robespierre? His head comes off. Okay, and it's in this history that the bloodbath spills like crazy in the French Revolution. If you're going to isolate the reign of terror into one year, it's that year. But you can also identify the reign of terror as this three and a half year period. And this is what Sister White points us to, 1793 to 1796. Three and a half years. Revelation 11 speaks about three and a half years. And in that three and a half years, you have a, a dictator 
at the beginning, Robespierre, and in 1795, which is right next to 1796, you have a new dictator come into French history. Who's he? Napoleon. Okay, so you got it in, if you're looking at that line from 1793 to 1796, which I would say 1793 on that first way mark, 1796. I hope you're, I'm not losing you because I'm going so fast. Why did, why did he die, Robespierre? Yeah. Because it, in the French Revolution was rebellion followed by rebellion. One political party taking control and over the other and it was just chaos, anarchy. What I'm saying is in the French Revolution we have at least three periods to plug in to the midnight cry, to the Sunday law. And this is what I did yesterday. Okay, and I never took time. What I took time this morning to tell you is that this history here would also, also be the Sunday law to the close of probation. Because this period is repeated in this period. This is the image of the beast testing time for the United States. This is the image of the beast testing time for the world. Okay, but I'm saying in terms of the French Revolution, that this is July 27th, 93, and this is July 27th, 94, that this is 1793 to 1717, 96. This is the three and a half years that Revelation 11 speaks about. And I'm saying that this is also 1789 to 1798-99, okay? I'm plugging all three of these histories into here, okay? So, are, are you okay, Clayton? It'd be better if you use the center of the board versus that corner, but that's okay. It'd be better if I use a set, but I, I might get over here at some point in time. Anyway, a fractal, one year in your notes. This, maybe you, maybe you can't see this, maybe this is stretching it, but the one year, 1793 to 1794, if you just take 93 and 94 and add them together, what do you get? 187. 187. What's 187? I mean, July 18. July 18. You have a plus there instead of an equal sign. Ah, okay. Thank you. There's a typo for everyone. It's 93 plus 94 equals 187. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, now, on this line here, what I want you to see, 93 to 96, history, they, they will talk that this is the time period of the Vendée War. Okay, in Western France, there was a group of people that were pro-Catholic. The French Revolution is doing away with Catholicism. So, in this history, you're going to see a, you have this period of time that, among other things, this three and a half year is a war against Catholicism. But I'm saying that what it's typifying in here is a war to support Catholicism. This is, this is when the image of the beast is formed. This is where the image of Catholicism is set up. And as I've said, is it okay to have an opposite yes. application? Okay. So I'm saying the Vendee War is speaking about the setting up of Catholicism in the United States, and therefore this being the USA, if we put it over here in the world, is the world setting up Catholicism from the Sunday law to the close of probation? Yes, okay, it works. So 17, um, okay, that's the two thoughts on those. And then of course 1789, this 10 year period. I wanna give you a, a numerical argument. Maybe you can accept it, maybe you can't. You should accept it, all right? The, the historians say 10 years for the French Revolution. And I'm saying that this one year, I can plug into it. So if you have 10 and you drop the zero, what do you get? One. One. 
Okay, so I, it, it, it fits. It's, it's just a, a, a casual uh, application that we do with zeros. So you have 1793, the very spot and the very day we went through this, that the first martyr in France was killed on January 21st. January 21st. January 21st. And the King of France later, 258 years later, in the same spot, 258 years later on January 21st is executed. Okay, and he's executed, a, a simplistic approach to it, he's executed because France rejected the Protestant Reformation. Okay, so the first Protestant martyr dies on January 21st. 258 years later, you reap what you sow. The King of France dies. So I want you to remember January 21st because there's someone else that dies on January 21st. And I'm going to say it's Josiah. But that's not for this study. It's for a later study. Josiah dies on January 21st. And I'm saying that the death at the beginning of the, the, uh, uh, France and at the execution of the king, um, among other things, is a symbol of rebellion. They're rebelling against the Protestant Reformation and they're rebelling against the monarchy of France and the Church of Rome in both tw those January 21st. Therefore, the 21st of, on two witnesses, the 21st of January, you should see a death. You should see death and rebellion. Okay, you follow my logic? So just keep that tucked away um, f for future reference. Next page. Um, The, the top quote from the spirit of prophecy, the greatest and most favored nation upon the earth is the United States. A gracious providence has shielded this country and poured upon her the choicest blessings of heaven. Um, and there is a quote. Um, if you go back to page two, speaking of France, the last on page two of your notes from Great Controversy 230, um, the last paragraph there says, when France rejected the gift of heaven, she sowed seeds of, seeds of anarchy and ruin. The, the gift of heaven is who? Christ, Protestant Reformation, his message. Christ or France rejected the gift of heaven. So now go to page three of your notes. The top paragraph there. The greatest and most favored nation upon the earth is the United States. A gracious providence has shielded this country and poured upon her the choicest of heaven's blessings. What's the choicest of heaven's blessings? It's the gift of heaven. The United States was given the same thing France was given. France rejected it and it brought upon itself the French Revolution. The United States is now rejecting it and therefore it is bringing upon itself the same response. Okay, This is our justification for plugging the French Revolution into this history. And we want to see the connection, the close connection between France and the United States because what we're looking at here at this portion of our study is the story of the King of the South and in 1798 France becomes the King of the South prophetically and now in our history the King of the South is Russia. The, the French Revolution is the beginning of the King of the South and it's speaking to the end of the King of the South which is Russia and we're saying right in here is where Russia comes to its end which is where France is coming to its end at the beginning. Okay, It's, it's just becoming a nation, the King of the South and it, it's, it's gone as a political symbol shortly thereafter as the King of the South moves on. In the same paragraph there from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, 
The infinite one keeps a reckoning with the nations and their guilt is proportionate, proportioned to the light given. All right. Rejected. rejected. The light rejected. So that's what France did. That's what the United States is doing. And this connects with another thought that by the amount of light you reject, what happens? Corresponding, Corresponding darkness, okay? Because darkness is one of the characteristics of this history. One of the things we didn't read yesterday, I don't think, from the Great Controversy 273, um, speaking of the French Revolution, and I, I, I'll just drop down to the second bold face in this. In the French Re Revolution, the weekly rest day was set aside, okay? So, what's that saying in this history? The Sabbath will be set aside. Right? Amen. If you're going to plug it in here. Now, but, but here's, here's a provocative thought, I believe, perhaps. Maybe provocative may be too strong of a word. Uh, they didn't, in the French Revolution, they didn't pass a Sunday law or a Sabbath law. They set aside the day of rest through a a weird providence, if I can say it that way. How did they set aside the day of rest? The day of rest, they understood, was Sunday. Okay? The Jews were, in, there was Jews in France. They knew about the Seventh-day Sabbath. But the day of rest that they set aside in the French Revolution was Sunday. And I'm saying they did it through a weird way. How'd they do it? They changed it into a 10-day week. They changed the calendar. Yeah. They made 10 days a week. Okay, 10 months in the year. Everything was 10. It's from that history that we get the decimal system. 10. It turns everything into 10. All right? You don't think that's valid? That's, that's where it came from. That's where the decimal system came from. It makes me hate it even more. Okay, so, so well, when you look at the French Revolution, that's what they did is they changed everything, not everything, but they changed many of the social norms to 10. 10 months in a year, 10 days in a week. If there's 10 days in a week, forget about Sunday if that's your day of rest. Okay, so... What does that speak to before we move away from that? It speaks to the fact that the day of rest will be changed in here, but also speaks to that France is a tenth part of the kingdom that was divided into ten. They're the number ten. Pagan Rome disintegrates into ten kingdoms, and the earthquake of the French Revolution overthrows this tenth kingdom, France, and it's working backwards here. The United States is coming to its conclusion and it's going to become the, it's already part of the United Nations, but it's going to become Ahab, the king over the ten kings. It's going to become a tenth part of the United Nations, of the globalists. It's going to be Ahab ruling over ten kings. So you got to see this number ten is both in France and in the United States, but... Isn't it kind of a weird providence? The whole world is being brought down by a p pandemic. And there's bodies lining up all over the place. Okay? And what's happening, among other things, is the mentality on planet Earth is, we don't ever want this to happen again. Okay? And the reason it happened, I mean, you can praise Trump all you want, that he shut down the airplane flights from China to America and prevented many of those Chinese that, or people that had been in China coming here and, and making the pandemic even worse. He shut down that, that border. And you can point to Donald Trump and say, boy, if you, if you want a justification for building the wall, well, here's a good justification. Build that wall. We don't need a bunch of people from South America flooding the United States, bringing in a pandemic. Okay, so, wow, wouldn't it be weird if they, they passed a law that in order for you to have a driver's license or a passport that you had to prove that you've been vaccinated against this, these possible pandemics. And if you don't prove that, 
then you can't travel. You can't buy or sell. Okay, so there's, there's things in this pandemic that are at least raising observations about how a Sunday law can get set up, how it can get prepared for a Sunday law that's just as weird providentially as France doing away with the day of rest by creating a 10-day week. All right, so I, that's just a thought to throw out there. Yesterday that, that Parminder and Tess are pushing to get the vaccinations. Any vaccinations that come, get them. Yeah, they were pushing that before we yes, were... Yes, they were. I'm just saying that it's... Mm -hmm. you, the, the same dissemination, the same, the, the same teachings that were disseminated that brought about the French Revolution. You can rest assured that Parminder and Tess, the good Jesuits that they are, are going to be promo promoting those, those ideas, even if they don't know that they're Jesuits. So, for the, a day of rest abolished in this history, um, American Constitution is also put in place in 1789, and this is where we're kind of switching gears, and you have your first president, George Washington, and the State Department begins. It's the first department of this new nation that formally begins. It begins on July 27th, 1789, 490 years after July 27th, 1299. So, this next quote is from Stephen Haskell. I want to read it all because there's several elements on it. I'm on page four. Um, he's dealing with Revelation 9. It says, They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is Destroyer. This character might, in truth, be imputed to the Arab caliphs, caliphs, who directed the armies for so many years after the death of Muhammad, but it is especially applicable to Ottoman, the founder of the Ottoman Empire. This, the first attempted centralization of government, was the outgrowth of the doctrines of Muhammad. Muhammad. Here, you got to see this. Ottman's coming into history, it's, he's going to tell us that Ottman first invades Nicodemia in, on July 27th, 1299. That's where we get that starting point for the 150 years of Revelation 9. Is this character he's referring to first invades Nicodemia, I think it is, or Nicomedia. Nicomedia. It's in here um, on that date. And, but my point is, is when does Muhammad come into history? He's right here on the chart. Okay, so this is 600 and some years, 700, almost 700 years later. So for 700 years, what I want you to see is Islam has been attacking Rome, but it's been doing it randomly. Okay, if, if we're here in this area, we're a group of Islamic warriors, and we take it upon ourselves to attack the Romans on our no, own initiative, and, and those Islamic warriors that live in Tennessee, they do the same thing, and those over there in California, they do the same thing, but it's not organized. The thing that makes Ottman different, and, and Haskell is pointing it here, is he brought the Islamic religion into a political structure. And why do you need to see that? You need to see that because he's marking the beginning of 490 years that ends with the State Department in the United States. Okay, he, he's associated not only with Islam, but with the connection of church and state in Islam. All right, so you got to see the political connection of Ottman, I believe, to get the 490 years. This is this, the first attempted centralization of government was the outgrowth of the doctrines of Muhammad. Ottman, says the historian, possessed and perhaps surpassed the ordinary virtues of a soldier and the circumstances of time and place were propitious to his independence and success. The close of the 13th century was near. 
The Crusades had thrust Europe against the Turks in a most reckless manner. Constantinople had numerous emperors, but the Greek government grew weaker and the time of its destruction was stealthily approaching. It was on July 27, 1299, says Gibbon, that Ottoman first invaded the territory of Nicomedia. And the singular accuracy of the date seems to disclose some foresight of the rapid destructive growth of the monster. More than human foresight recorded this date with such definiteness. To the prophet on Patmos, it had been revealed that their power was to hurt men five months. Five prophetic months is equivalent of 150 literal years, one day meaning a year, and counting 30 days to a month. Since the exact day for the beginning of this power is given, the expiration of the five months may be reckoned to the day. It closed July 27, 1449. It is these dates which enable the student of the trumpets to locate the events which take place under each trumpet. These dates are nails in a sure place for both the first and second woe. The death of Amaroth in 1451 and the succession of Muhammad II, a wily man full of ambition and restless of restraint, did not, did not retard the conquest. Muhammad's one design was to capture Constantinople. Peace was on his lips, but war was in his heart, and every energy was bent toward the accomplishment of, his, of this design. At midnight, this is what the historians record, at midnight, Muhammad II, not Muhammad I, Muhammad II, he, he once started from his, from his bed and demanded the immediate attender, attendance of his prime visor. The man came trembling, fearing the detection of some previous crime. He made his offering to the sultan, but was met with the words, I ask a present far more valuable important, Constantinople. At midnight, he decides he wants to take Constantinople. Muhammad II tested the loyalty of his soldiers, warned his ministers against the bribery of the Romans, studied the art of war and the use of firearms, and he engaged the service of a founder of a cannon, Urban, from Europe, okay, the cannon maker. He engaged the services of a founder of cannon who promised weapons that could batter down the walls of the city. In April 1453, the memorable, memorable siege was formed. Okay, so we've, we've placed Muhammad II right there at the midnight cry. That's not my point. I'm looking at July 27th right now. Now, so July 27th is the end of 490 years in terms of the State Department. We're dealing with the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of France. We're seeing a connection there, wills within wills. When was the Constitution of the United States and France put in place? 1789. When, when was the first department of the new government of the United States began? It's co now called the State Department. On July 27th. When, was, uh, when did Ottman first invade Nicomedia, which Stephen Haskell says is a prophetic nail in a sure place. July 27th, 1299. You may not remember in this series, but we took time to look at 490 years and what it meant. And 49. This is 490 years. What does 490 years represent as a Seventh-day Adventist? Probationary. probationary time. This is a probationary period of time and it closes right here. It's 70 weeks in Daniel 9. Okay. And in those 70 weeks, what happens at the very end? There's a week down here, right? The final week. The 70th week. What takes place in the 70th week? Christ comes to confirm the covenant with many for one week. This would also be 30, 34 AD. This is the final week of the 70 weeks. 
right? Yes. Okay, so this here, he's confirming the covenant with many for one week. How, how much information is in this part of the 490? We won't get into right now, but I do want to point out that it's this history here that you can show is the history of the sealing, right? I mean, this is typifying the sealing. Christ's baptism, his death, the stoning of Stephen when the door is closed. Do you get, do you have to settle into the truth after the door closes or before the door closes? Where does the door close in this history? Right here with the stoning of Stephen, right? So this is an illustration of the sealing time of the 144,000. When does it begin? At 9-11, right? Because on AD 27, does not the angel come down out of heaven? The divine symbol at his baptism? Okay, so we could go on and on talking about this 490 years that begins on July 27, 1299 and is dealing with Islam and ends dealing with the USA. At the beginning of this history, you have a false prophet, Islam. At the end, you have the United States that is going to be the false prophet. Okay, Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. And in this 490 years of probationary time, the last week is the, the sealing time, yes? Okay, so the United States, it begins as a government in 1789. But if you, if you look at the money of the United States, it has a, an emblem of the United States on it. And what's it called? It's called the Great Seal of the United States. Yeah. And when was the Great Seal introduced? 7 years before. The Great Seal comes in here. This is the sealing time. So this history of the United States, this isn't a random connection with the 490. The Great Seal comes 7 years in 17 82, the Great Seal is invented. We have some information on it as we proceed in these studies. This is the sealing time that brings us to 1789, connects the false prophet of Islam with the false prophet of the United States. But what we're looking at now is July 27th. Yes? How was the false prophet of the United States figured in 1299 period, the first mark? Yeah. This is Islam. Yes. What is Muhammad? He's a, uh, He's a false prophet. Oh, okay. Islam prophetically is a false prophet. In the book of Revelation, you have two threefold unions, so to speak. The threefold union that is the one we apply is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, based on Revelation 16, that lead the world to Armageddon. But you have three powers in Revelation that come up out of the bottomless pit. In Revelation 17, the papacy comes up out of the bottomless pit. That's the beast. In Revelation 11, atheistic France comes up out of the bottomless pit. That's the dragon. But in Revelation 9, where does Muhammad come from? He comes out of the bottomless pit. He's the false prophet. So you have the threefold union in Revelation 16 of the dragon, the beast, false prophet. But if you gather together the bottomless pits in the book of Revelation, you have the dragon in Revelation 11, the beast in Revelation 17, and the false prophet in Revelation 9. Islam is a type of false prophet. The United States, the United States at this point is not the false prophet even. You know, it's just destined to be. When is it going to be the false prophet? It began to fulfill its role at the false prophet when it rejected the first angel's message in 1843. Okay, in 1843. So... I have a question. Okay. I don't know how to raise my hand on this yet. That's how. Okay. You've laid out the history of the 490 of the false prophet, beginning with the false prophet, ending with the false prophet, but you put the one week at the end of a true prophet. How are you combining those two things and 
There. I put the one week at the end of the true prophet. No, you've used, you said false prophet, false prophet, and then you've had this one week there at the end, and you're yeah. saying this is the true prophet being confirmed. How are you able to combine a false and a true on a, on a single line? Oh, I'm not trying to say this is the true prophet. I'm saying that ultimately the... But it is. It's Christ. Christ oh, you're talking about putting plugging Christ line in there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Who the people choose at the cross? Barabbas. A false prophet. Barabbas. What's Bar mean? Son of. What's Abba mean? Father. In the French Revolution, the we see the pattern of Christ as illustrated by Christ, but those two patterns give us the pattern of the Antichrist. They're, it's okay to, to do that. It's, it's the story of Esther's husband, what's his name? Mordecai. Oh, no. Uh, her uncle, Mordecai. Ahasuerus? Okay. Is he a good guy or a bad guy? Is Esther a pure woman or, or a corrupt woman? Okay. It depends on the context. So, okay. Let me go take, take you to notes number two because I have to close here because I want to do a second presentation. But I want to take you to notes number two today. Okay. The one that says three touches of Daniel. I want to just, at, at this point, what we're going into in the second set of notes is 45. 45th President of the United States. I'm going to pass over right now three touches, Daniel 10, 19. We'll come back to that, Lord willing, at some point in time. And take you to verse 45. First, let me show you. On this chart, on two witnesses, this chart here, this sacred table, Sister White says, was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. Says the Lord held his hand over, mistaken some of the figures, but we've understood the figures he held his hand over were right here. Okay, he held his hand over the fullness of the year mistake, and this should have been 1844, and this should have been 1844. We have no justification for saying that any of these other figures had a problem with it. Okay, so directed by the hand of the Lord should not be altered. So there's a figure on this chart that re appears twice. Therefore, it's established. And it's right here. It's number 45. And down here again, number 45. 45 is on this chart. Okay, but this 45 on this chart, where does it come from? Where does it come from? It comes from this, right? This formula. Daniel 12. From the taking away of the daily shall be 1,335 days. Okay. When was the daily taken away? 508. 508, 1,290 years takes you to 1798. And from the taking of the way of the daily in Daniel what? Daniel 12, 12. 12, 12. What's 12 times 12? 144,000. But what is Daniel 12, 12? It's a doubling. Okay, so Daniel 12, 12 is speaking about the end of the world. And you have it in there. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,335 days. And what I'm saying, <clears throat> the 1,335 days is connected to the 45 in both places. Okay, it's... If you don't have the 1335, you don't have the 45 on this chart. And I'm saying that this history is the history of the 45th president of the United States. It's the history of, of Daniel 11:40 to 45. Verse 45 summarizes the whole ver all the verses. It's how the world is divided into two classes. Okay, so 45 is on this chart. It's connected to 1335. And the key word there to me is cometh. You see the definition of cometh in your notes. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. And when does the thousand three hundred and forty five days end? 1843. Does it not? Yes. Okay. What does 1843 touch? 44. Okay, it touches 1844. 
So how is there a blessing to coming to here? I'm, I'm saying the blessing is, is coming to right here where they touch. What was the blessing? The blessing was that the Lord removed His hand. Right? A, a, at a simple level. Now they can see the fullness of the year and they can see October 22nd, 1844. That's the seventh month movement. That's the midnight cry. That's the empowerment of the Millerite message is when the Lord removes His hand. Yes? Amen. Therefore, the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. The blessing for us, if you can follow this logic, is when the Lord removes His hand. And when did the Lord remove His hand? December 17th, 2016. Raphia and Paneum were opened up. And it's Raphia and Paneum that's shedding all this light right now. Okay? Raphia Paneum. This, this structure that we're, we were given allows us to see the kingdom of the papacy in this history, the kingdom of the dragon in this history, the kingdom of the false prophet in this history, and the kingdom of the 144,000. And this is what he used to allow us to see this. And we didn't see it until he removed his hands. So there was a blessing here. Okay, there was a blessing here. Yes? This blessing here is the blessing of the fullness of the year mistake. But this blessing has with it the number 45. Is this an okay place to write on the board? All right. So, you see some multiplication there. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the chronologist among us. But 1335, 1 times 3 times 3 times 5 is what? 45. 45. Okay, so 1335, 1 times... 3 times 3 times 5 equals 45. All right. There's another number that does that very same thing. Okay, it's the number 1533. Okay, 1 times 5 times 3 times 3 is 45. They're the same numbers. Of course they would do that, yes. Yes, they're the same numbers. Okay. But I want to show you, when we get to this next study, that, I'll put this in the center of the board, from 9-11 to here, the midnight cry to the Sunday law, Midnight Cry, the Sunday Law, is 1533. What's my justification for doing that? You should already have an answer for me. What's your question again? What's my justification for taking this history here and saying that's 1533? It's a glorious manifestation of the power of God. A great controversy. Yeah, great. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. This is August 11th. 1840, this is October 22nd, 1844, and from this date to this date is 1,533 days. So this history here is representing 1533, glorious manifestation of the power of God, which in our history from 9-11 until the Sunday Law, we should see a glorious manifestation of the power of God, which should be 1533. And in the... When we get to it, I don't know for the next presentation, I want to show you that here, David begins to rule in Hebron, and here, David begins to rule in Jerusalem. And also, I want to show you that in here, the temple is being built, and here the temple is lifted up. How long did David rule in Hebron? 7.5 years. 
how long did it take Solomon to build the temple? 7.5 years. What's 7.5 and 7.5? It's 15. How long did David rule in Jerusalem? 33 years. If you can see it. The blessing of the 1335 is the blessing of the 1533. Amen. It happens when the Lord removed his hand. And he removed his hand from Raphia and Paneum. And Raphia and Paneum were removed, was removed when? We'll bring this to a close. In December of 2016, what had just happened in December of 2016? What had just happened in November? Okay, what, what had happened in November? Nobody knows? Shall we pray? We'll come back to our studies after we take a short break. For those of you that are watching live stream, we're going to take about a 15-minute break and try to come back at 9.30. Shall we pray? Oh, wait a second. Is there any questions out there? Yes, we're, I have a question. Yep. You had 7.5 for David and Hebron, and what was the other 7.5? Solomon building the temple. In 7.5 years? Yep. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Not a problem. Because it's about church and state. It's about the throne of David. That's the state. And the temple is the church. Heavenly Father, we um, ask now that you would refresh our minds as we take a short break. We thank you for the light that you're unfolding to us. We thank you for the ability to see some of the events that are taking place now in the prophetic context, not in the human context that uh, these things that are causing panic and fear among human beings around planet Earth now, if understood correctly, can be a, a way of producing joy in the, the hope of your soon return because the evidence is clear that you are about to finish your work of judgment and come and take your people home. We thank you for this light in Jesus' name. Amen.